We're going to be discussing what comes first after you have determined something needs to be done about your loved one's memory, and that is having the crucial conversation. Welcome to the channel. I'm Joe, and today we have a special guest again, my sister Jackie, and we're going to be talking more about caring for aging parents who have dementia. It's really important that you treat your loved one with the respect and the dignity that they deserve, but they're not going to be happy with you. In fact, they can get pretty angry. And we're just going to share some of the experiences that we have had with our parents who had dementia and how we handled it. We're not experts and we're not doctors. We're just two daughters who have been figuring this out along the way as we've dealt with our parents who had dementia. It took us several tries talking to our parents. The first couple of times we were shut down. Quickly. It was not going to be discussed. They were not dead. They could take care of themselves. They were not hearing any of it. During this time, they couldn't keep their appointments straight. They couldn't pay their bills. They couldn't figure out their phones or their TVs or remotes. They were they, washing their dishes in, in Clorox. Clorox. They were eating expired food. They were burning things in the kitchen. There were just a lot of signs that indicated to us it's time that we have a crucial conversation. You need to brace yourself for it, but it's kind of like put your big girl panties on and do what needs to be done. One of the first things I had to do was take the car keys away from my mother. She oh. did not like that. I can understand why. They're feeling robbed of their independence. Any semblance of control she may have had, she knew she was losing. That car represented independence for her and by taking it away, it really sent her into a spiral. But you have to come to the point, whether it's washing their dishes in Clorox or her driving around town and having an accident and hurting herself or someone else, that's when you have to decide this has got to happen. Even though you're gonna get blowback from them, mm -hmm. you just have to keep pushing forward. And if it doesn't happen the first time, try try again, just keep pushing forward. I believe it was in that Mike Glenn book, Coffee with Mom, that we mentioned last time. I'll put the link in the description. He was facing the same thing with his mother and a lawyer friend said, are you the power of attorney? He said, yes. And he said, well, imagine what a savvy lawyer could do to put you on the stand after there had been a terrible accident to say, you are the power of attorney and you were aware that your parent was not capable of driving and that could blow back on you. So for a lot of reasons, her own safety, the safety of others, the legal ramifications, we knew it was time to take the keys, but it wasn't easy. And they remembered it for a long time. Yes. The second thing that we brought up to them was having a sitter come into the house. Mm -hmm. I had been going over every Saturday, organizing their medicines for the entire week, daytime medicines, nighttime medicines, everything was clearly And lighting. there are a lot of medicines. And the older your parent gets, the likelihood that they will have more and more medications is really strong. Yeah. And not even dementia meds, just other things that are going on with them. But everything was clearly marked, mm -hmm. daytime, nighttime, which day of the week, and they would still get it all mixed up. We actually, before we brought up the sitters, we had a local pharmacy mm -hmm. who would package their medicines individually. So all they had to do was just pop it. It was on a cardboard sheet. And we started that, but we started it too late. But it is an excellent thing. Before your parent gets to an assisted living or memory care situation, I can highly recommend it. In fact, I go into more detail about that medication bubble pack system in another video that I'll link up in the description. But back to the sitters now. We brought up the possibility of them needing sitters to help them. The medicine situation was taken care of, but they were still needing help getting to the restroom, mm -hmm. taking showers, just cooking, all of those things. We were trying to take as much stress off of them 
because we realized all of those little things were stressing them out to the point to where they were so tightly wound, they were frustrated with each other and everything else. And so we wanted to just eliminate the and stress. And my father was having such bad back issues at this point that every time he'd get up, my mother would jump up and feel like she had to walk him every step of the way because she feared he would fall all the time. She we, just ended up getting in, in the his way. way. It was getting to the point to where it was a safety issue for both of them to have someone else there since we couldn't be there 24 seven. And maybe they wouldn't bicker <laughs> if they had somebody else yeah. doing those things for, for them. I will tell you, for both of our parents, it was very difficult for them to relinquish any responsibility for their own well-being, whether it's helping them to the restroom or helping them walk across the floor or picking up something that fell under a table. My mother would feel like she could get down there and get it because she had always gotten down on the floor and gotten whatever she needed. But as she got older, that became a, a huge safety concern. So we had to bring up another option. Assisted living. And this really wasn't an option for them, at this point, my father had been in rehab and they had told us that they would not be able to live on their own when he was released from rehab. They highly recommended that we make arrangements to either have a full-time sitter or assisted, assisted living. living. And that's what we ended up doing. The assisted living idea was a little easier pill to swallow. Wasn't great, especially for my mother. Daddy loved the place where they were. He enjoyed all the amenities and the extra activities. He just wasn't physically able to get out and enjoy it like he would have yeah, liked Yeah, he it. couldn't really take advantage of everything they had to offer right. there. But we did not move them to assisted living without their permission. Jenny took Mama to several places and that was the one that she ended up liking the best as well. Of course, she didn't remember that. So, so as she's telling other people and looking back on how we made that decision, it was really that we forced them to move when in right. fact they wrote the check. They were still capable of writing checks at that point. Daddy even told us which realtor to call right. to, to list the house with and we followed his instructions and she was fabulous. The house sold very quickly mm -hmm. and had several options. We took the options to daddy in rehab yeah. and he signed off on it. Everything was great, we thought. Until they got there and they didn't remember signing off on it, giving their permission. Luckily, we had gone through a realtor and actually had the realtor meet with them even though they cognitively weren't quite as savvy as just we were even a few months. including them yeah, in the just, process so right. that they weren't being taken care of. They right. were still involved, a vital part involved. of it. So we were able to show them documents that they had signed. Um, and I even got to the point to where when I sold the car, which was a whole nother situation, um, I videotaped my daddy on the phone. and. I can highly recommend you do that because it may be a situation where he just will not believe that he gave permission to sell the car. So I just had to say, I had to say, can I take you saying that you're allowing me to sell the car? And, and he said yes. He said yes. And I had to show that to him more than once because he claimed that we sold it without his permission. Well, he claimed that he left rehab and he never went back to his house. We sold it without him knowing anything about it and didn't have a car when they got there. Mm -hmm. Another key piece of advice would be make arrangements for your parents to be somewhere else when it comes time to move them from their home into an assisted living situation because the stress factor is really high and there's a lot of anxiety involved. It's chaos and moving boxes and people are taking their prized possessions away. And it just was better that we had a relative or a friend come stay with them or take them shopping or to lunch or something while Jackie and I moved them into assisted living. By the time they got there, 
Every picture was hung, every flower vase was in place, every lamp, everything was, was all settled. So they, they just walked into a, a new place that had as many Turkey. it was ready. <laughs> as yeah. many of their possessions and treasures that they had built up over the years as we could fit into a smaller apartment. Right. And the stress thing, let's go back to that for just a second. It's not just to have them not be stressed out. You are going to be stressed out while you're moving. Right. Because you are fully aware that you are downsizing your parents. Mm -hmm. And for our parents, they moved from a very large home to a smaller home when they came to the same town where I was. And now it was a small little place. It was place. like the square footage kept getting halved, right. you know. <laughs> and so when you're stressed out and you're trying to get everything ready for them, to have them, I hate to say underfoot, but if they were there, you would have to be dealing with them being stressed out and not wanting that piece taken and I want that. Mm -hmm. And it would just add to there the were, There were a couple of things uh, that were kind of overwhelming. We knew that we could not keep all of their furniture and possessions. And my mother was a master genealogist. She had probably 30 legal boxes of genealogy files, all neatly labeled with it, in addition to having them all online and on computer. But she had a lot of files and we had to find a home for them because it was very important to her that we not throw those out. Also, when we opened up the cabinets in their den, they had volumes of photo albums and scrapbooks that we really had no, no idea, idea they had. So I went out, hurriedly bought a flatbed scanner and started scanning all the photos in those albums so that we could get rid of those big bulky items that they would have no space for in their new place. I actually made a video on how to digitize all those photo albums and I'll link it in the description. So we get them to assisted living. The adjustment is being made. And we're feeling pretty good about it because they have a button that they wear around their neck. And there's one hanging in, in each bathroom. Yeah. If we could just get them to push the button, they're gonna be well taken care of. But we talked about this in our last episode. They would not call for help. They just would not do it. So they began to fall. And that's when the director called me and said, we are going to have to insist that they have a full-time sitter because we just can't be responsible for their safety. So she went ahead and hired the sitter and my parents went ballistic. They absolutely went ballistic. Because remember, they had already told us in no uncertain terms. Right. They were not having a sitter. Right, and that was back when they lived mm -hmm. in their home. Now we're at assisted living and they're being asked to have one and they are not having it. So it was a huge blow up. In fact, my parents met with the director and she told me later in 30 years, she had never allowed a resident to overrule a decision that she had made, but my parents were the first. <laughs> So she backed off that decision and, it, you know, she probably knew it wasn't the right thing, but they were so incensed by the notion of having a sitter. Now, here's the interesting thing. Not three or four weeks later, they knew they had to have a sitter. And my mother knew that my father needed the help. My father knew he needed the help and everything was fine. In fact, they ended up loving the sitter yeah. and not only was she help in terms of safety and getting them moved and where they needed to be she reminded them to drink water because UTIs are a huge problem right she would have my father on a timer so he would drink enough water and this is a huge thing when parents get older they think they're drinking a lot of water but in reality, they've gone from a large insulated tumbler to a small styrofoam cup because it's easier to hold. It's not heavy. Mm -hmm. It surprised me how everything became heavy. heavy. Mm -hmm. So they went 
to a styrofoam cup and only filled it up halfway. And if they took a few swallows of it, they thought that was enough for the day. And then we get into this cycle of UTIs. The sitter also came in very handy because during that time, mama had to go into the hospital. And so daddy could not move around by himself. And she had been the primary caregiver, helping him up when he needed it. And all of a sudden, she wasn't there. So that kind of worked itself out in terms of establishing the notion of having a sitter around all the time. And it ended up being great company for them, you know, uh, because they were used to just like staring at one another and not talking to anyone else all day long. All of a sudden, you've got another person in the room, and it's a social situation for them, you know, a right. conversation. And unfortunately, our parents, who had been married for 60, 61 years, shared a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. They were the love of each other's lives. We knew. They made no bones about it. If something were to happen and we were all together and they could only save one person, mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be us. No. <laughs> they were going to save each other. Which is one of the best gifts they ever gave us. We knew how much they loved one another and their marriage was a blessing to us. They taught us what it is to be husband and wife, how to treat people with kindness and love and respect. So it was a surprise to us when they reached this level of dementia that they started bickering with one another and really having a low tolerance because we had never seen that before. It was devastating. Yeah. It, it was so hard to watch them take out all of their Frustrations. Fear. Yeah, fear. A, a lot of it was their fear. I know mama would look at daddy and she was so scared about what the future held mm -hmm. and how she would get along without him. Daddy was so consumed and concerned with mama's well-being. Uh, you know, so a lot of it was fear mm -hmm. and they would take it out on each other. Now, part of that was because they were pretty housebound. Daddy's back caused him to not be able to get out and do a lot of the things that he would have otherwise been out doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that togetherness just gets to be too much. Yeah. So they both confided in us separately out of earshot of the other how their feelings had been so hurt by the other one. Mm -hmm. And it, it really got to the point to where we had to have another crucial conversation. In fact, you may have to have several crucial conversations along this journey because their circumstances are going to evolve to, to where they need more and more assistance and they're gonna fight it every step of the way. And you're gonna have to step in and do what needs to be done. The crucial conversation that we had to have, we need to find y'all Separate. separate living spaces. You can be in the same facility. And at one point we even said, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they don't need to be across the hall from each other. If my father was across the hall or down the hall, she is still going to be tending to him just as though he were in the same apartment with her. So uh, the doctor even advised us that that would not be what he would recommend. I mean, he was recommending separate. Mm -hmm separate places. If the sitter did not go over well, <laughs> you can only imagine how that went over. Yeah. Um, they were not having any of it. So we looked them dead in the eye and said, then y'all are going to have to stop treating each other this way. They weren't really able to control how they were treating each other at that point. Mm -hmm. They were just in that stage of dementia where they could see it in the other one, but they couldn't see it in them. And there was no way that they could stop it by themselves. But then life stepped in and we didn't have to make the decision to separate them. Daddy went into the hospital and I didn't leave. Mm -hmm. um, that was a 
crucial conversation that we didn't have to follow up again. You may find yourself in a different situation and you may have to continue to revisit it if your parents are exhibiting the same mm -hmm. kinds of behaviors towards each other. Mm -hmm. They would have died if they had known how they were really treating each other. Yeah. That would never have happened without the disease of dementia mm -hmm. uh, plaguing them the way it did. The last crucial conversation that we had to have was with my mother. My mother was in the hospital when my father died. Well, they were in two separate hospitals at the same time. So Jackie and I would tag team. She would be at one hospital, I would be at the other, and then we'd swap. And when my father died, we had to go to the hospital where my mother was and tell her that he had died. That will be something that you need to gird yourself for because it was devastating to her. And to see her break down like she did was almost more than, than we could take. But you can do it. You can do it. Somehow, God spoke through me. I was able to yeah. look her in her eyes. I was able to just have my hands around her as I was telling her. And the words just came. They weren't mine. That was really God telling her about daddy. As hard as that was, we ended up having to tell her more than once that he had died. We finally wised up and decided that it was not necessary to keep telling her that he had died because she would forget and she would relive it every time we told her again. That is when the people at the facility said, the best thing you can do for yourself is give yourself permission to say a little white lie. So you're saving them from having to relive and take that on again. But the trade-off is now you're absorbing that pain. You just need to know that. We're just trying to give you information that caught us totally off guard. Yeah. We were not prepared for these things. So it would have been nice if somebody had, had shared their experience. So that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do. We're going to continue having these conversations, sharing with you our experiences, and our next episode will be quality of life for your parent and for you. So if you're getting value out of this, or you maybe you know someone else who's going through a similar situation with their parent, please share with them and don't forget to like and subscribe.